your team. This is Velasquez, and I just want to introduce um, a little bit of our final wrap-up piece for our migration unit, which is part of our population and migration unit three. All right, so a great strategy right now is to make sure you have your geolog book handy. Also, I want you to make sure you take out your lecture, which was provided in class. It has a few Google slides that I want to go over and some different maps. Um, so reminder, the goal is to use the lectures to annotate, take additional notes, and write down some examples. Okay, first half of the lection, uh, lecture, I should say, we'll be covering that piece. Second half, I just want to wrap up some loose ends looking at some different laws of migrations, uh, migration transition. And this is also included in your migration packet, which has the reading guide. All right, so migration is a quick unit, so it's definitely important you definitely uh, finish up your AMSCO and make sure you're addressing some key aspects of migration. So here we go. Before we get started, let's go ahead and flash back just a little bit and just make sure we're defining the difference of what is migration. Okay, so different types of movement. Remember, movement is one of our five things of geography in that case. So if we're looking at migration, we're not necessarily looking at um, different types of movement, right? We can look at cyclical movement, we can look periodic movement, and actual migration carries it with a degree of permanence. Um, so it's a change of residence that's intended to be permanent in that case. We can look at two different types of migration, and this is what I want to review with us. The two differences, right, is the difference between a forced and a voluntary migration. And keep in mind, you're also working with your partner, of course, on the case study. And the case study is meant for you to apply um, the three college board standards. Right? If we're looking at migration, College Board wants you to know the causes. It wants you to know the difference between a forced and voluntary, be able to identify different examples. And then finally, it's really going to want you to focus on um, your ESPN impact. So how do migrants uh, impact economic, socially, politically, and possibly environmentally? All right, on our screen, we have some different push and pull factors we've identified. Reminder, if you're still getting confused with the difference between push and pull factors, we want to think about what is drawing a migrant to come to this new location, right, to make this permanent change. Is it because there's a job? Is it because there's fertile land? Um, is there greater opportunity? Is a better quality of life? Is there more a stable government, political security, right? Those would be things that make you want to move and make this change. Versus the push factors, right, are basically ways for us to think of why are you leaving? Right? Is a crime rate high? Are you not providing services, provided services? Um, is there poverty? Is there unemployment? Is there a war or conflict? Right? Those can be very powerful push factors that can cause someone to want to migrate further. All right, in class, we also distinguish the two different types. We are looking at two different ways we can divide migration, right? Internal migration versus international. For internal migration, we looked at two different, right, inter-regional, right, and we played around with this map in class looking at migration across the United States between different regions, right, the region of Southern California, maybe to the region of the Pacific Northwest, or again looking at Texas in the south, or again up in here in the northeast, right, so we can look at push, pull, push and pull factors of why people are migrating within um, those different regions. Okay, then we also have intra-regional, uh, that includes within the same region, okay, so we can have rural to urban, right, if we're talking from the farm to the city, or if we're looking later on when we get to our urban unit, we'll look at migration from urban to suburban, right, as things change in society, especially if we're focusing on America, right, post-World War II, we'll look at the rise of the suburbs, which is basically, again, where people felt that the cities were too crowded and too crime-filled and, and not suitable to um, be able to have their family, okay, so they wanted to migrate out and they wanted to sort of create their own American dream with a dog and a cat and a garage and 2.5 children. Um, so we can look at migration back and forth. So intra-regional will be within the same area, but again, usually we look at urban to uh, rural in that case. Well, we're looking at voluntary migration. Uh, when it comes to considering pull factors, the principle of distance decay definitely comes into play. So we're talking about prospective migrants, 
they're more likely to have complete perceptions of a near place than farther ones, right? You might have kind of a general sense, well, gee, what would it be like to live in, you know, Nevada, right? It's kind of similar climate. Maybe you've been there. You've had family that lives over there versus, gee, what would it be like to live in New Jersey or Vermont? Or maybe what would it be like to live in Tokyo, right? We have some idea generally kind of our perceptual um, of what it would be like. But we see in this case that a lot of people uh, would feel more comfortable um, if they leave a little bit closer to home. So interaction with farther away places generally decreases as distance increases. So prospective migrants are likelier to feel much less certain about distant destinations than about nearer ones, right? I might be more comfortable migrating to a closer location versus just packing up my bags and sort of traveling around the world. We also know that a lot of people want to still have that interaction with their family members, right? If we're looking at distance decay, we analyzed in class, right, the map, and we see most migrants, for example, in Mexico tend to stay um, in the American South. Now, there's multiple reasons, right? But one of the reasons we could argue, of course, is that distance decay, the farther away you are from something, the less interaction. Okay, so voluntary migration is definitely impacted by the concept of distance decay. This is a unit one concept um, that definitely here um, shows its face again in understanding why and how migrants move. All right, we can also continue to break down voluntary migration in um, some more categories. So for example, you can choose to look at voluntary migration in something called chain migration. So chain migration, I want you to think of it almost like that chain link fence, right? There's a link. So if you find that there's a family member that has settled in a destination, right? We're more likely to have a migrant to um, go travel or make that movement to try to reunite with that family member. So we've seen that, and this is where we talked about right in the news. Chain migration also um, gets referenced quite often with this concept of for example, if we have someone coming from Mexico, right, they might make the permanent move to Illinois. Uh, maybe a father moves there, and then several years later, right, he might save some money, and then he might send back to um, his brother, right, and he might uh, help his brother come over and sort of set him up and help him also locate to the city. Or we could see family members, right? We might see someone bring uh, their children over or their wife over or spouse over in that case. Now, even though the actual process, uh, a lot of people point to it as it's really easy just to you know, bring someone over. Of course, some of us know it, it's a much uh, intensive process, especially if you're trying to do that legally. So at least that process, it takes about plus five years. But chain migration, right, is just a basically way to reunite family members. This also creates a situation in which we see uh, the word enclaves. The enclaves are basically where we see these little pockets of these different cultural areas Case of point, again, if we see, um, we're talking about, again, Mexican-American migration, we see these little areas in which, again, culturally, right, the, the, the dress, the language, the food, almost feels like that these migrants, again, sort of have their, um, have their way of life in these little pockets, right? So little Arabia, little Saigon, um, little TJ. So these little Italy in that case are basically like these little pockets where we see um, the culture and this really has to do with our discussion of chain migration. All right, we can also have our discussion of voluntary migration looking at rural to urban, right? So migration streams may appear on maps to be long and unbroken, uh, but we can also introduce when we look at this type of migration, we can look at something called step migration. So for example, if a peasant farmer in rural Brazil um, for example, it's likely to move first to a village and then maybe to a nearby town. And then maybe after that, they would go to a city. And then finally, they would go to maybe a major metropolitan like Rio de Janeiro. So at each stage of that step, right, there's different push and pull factors that sort of um, call in the way in that case. All right, then we can also begin to look at something known as forced migration. So some examples in your textbook that you'd be reading about, and I know a few of you have chosen for your case study project, right? Most famously in our American history, we could talk about the forced migration, uh, looking at the Atlantic slave trade 
in the 1400s to roughly around the 1800s, in which Africans were captured and sold into slavery and transported across um, the Atlantic, of course, to be sold into plantations and economies in North America, as well as Central and South American countries. Again, looking to American history books as well, we can look at the forced migration, for example, of the Indian removal, right? So in eighth grade history or in push, you talked about the Trail of Tears. Um, so Native Americans were forcibly removed and again, forced to move across um, uh, so that English or American settlers could claim this land. Okay, so Indian removal is an example of forced migration historically. Here's just a map to kind of take a look at. So in which countries? So another type of um, forced migration is human trafficking. So a lot of times students will be, you know, we talk about slavery, right? We think of it something just in the history books, but sad to say our world definitely um, has human uh, trafficking, human slavery today. Uh, when we talked about gender, this is a huge issue in the developing world where young girls are also typically um, higher rates involved in human trafficking. And we take a moment to kind of WOQI in this case, what, what this is human trafficking occurs in all continents. Uh, the US began fighting earnest in the early 2000s and the first decade of the fight has brought the issue into a clearer focus. Okay, so again, you can see arrows show what countries or regions are providing the most victims, interesting enough, of human trafficking. So human trafficking is an example of a forced migration. Okay, we also, when we talked about forced migration, we could also talk about refugees. So refugee is someone that's going to claim that if they do not get a chance to leave, if they um, stay in their home country, they can result in losing their life or be persecuted or held up to the government or be um, a war or conflict. So this map is taking a look at refugees worldwide, worldwide in this case. So countries which refugees come from, okay, so we can see um, areas in Southwest Asia, we can see again areas in um, sort of Eastern Africa, Central Africa, and then countries that have taken in refugees. Say United States, we do at this time. Um, that's been slowed down, obviously, due to our political leaders. But previously, the United States was some place that would take in political refugees more willingly. You can see that in parts of, again, Western Europe, for example, Germany, also, again, had used to be at the top of the list of a country that would welcome in. And they would welcome in and offer something called asylum. So if you're seeking asylum, you're seeking a safe place, right? You're seeking that you're allowed to come into the country and the country will accept you. And then hopefully, eventually again, transition to you into becoming a resident of that particular country. Or again, if there's ever a situation in which you could return to your, your home country. Most famously in the last few years, we had the Syrian refugee crisis. Um, so when we have uh, Southwest Asia, particularly Syria, that was under control of ISIS, there was mass bloodshed in the area, and we see a mass exodus of Syrians uh, that were forced to literally walk and travel through boat to try to seek asylum across into, especially looking into Western Europe in that case. Um, so families that were fleeing for violence. So families that are fleeing for violence. Again, this is not a case that where they did not like the government. This is a case of a life and death situation for a refugee. 